The White House announcing yesterday fully vaccinated travelers will be allowed to enter the U.S. beginning November 8th. But here at home, there are still millions of eligible Americans who are not vaccinated. Numerous cities and employees have issued vaccine mandates, but many people continue to resist those vaccine requirements. Here's ABC's Ike Echiachi with the details. An FDA advisory panel voting on Friday to recommend authorization of booster shots for the 15 million Americans who received the Johnson & Johnson single-shot vaccine. We do have um, 19 out of 19 unanimous uh, yes votes for this question. Data from Johnson & Johnson shows a booster two months after the first shot increases protection up to 94% against moderate to severe COVID symptoms. You still had 85% protection against serious illness. That was all excellent. Now we, we've gone from excellent to even much better with that second dose. And I do think the CDC likely will recommend this as a two-dose vaccine. Health experts on the FDA's vaccine panel are waiting for additional data on whether it's safe for J&J &J recipients to mix booster doses, though a recent study from the National Institute of Health shows they may benefit more from the Pfizer or Moderna mRNA boosters. But this was based on antibody levels, only one part of overall immunity. It does seem like um, that there, again, some consensus that this is an important um, option for people to have. More and more vaccine mandates are going into effect, but not everyone is willing to roll up their sleeves. In Everett, Washington, about 200 Boeing employees staged a protest against the company's vaccine mandate that will go into effect on December 8th. In Chicago, a court battle is heating up between the city and police force, about half of which is unvaccinated. We've seen from uh, the Fraternal Order of Police and particularly the leadership is a lot of misinformation, a lot of half-truths and frankly flat-out lies. And in order to induce an insurrection. The city announcing those who do not get vaccinated will be placed on a no pay status. The police union filing a motion to dismiss the mayor's complaint. Ike Jachi, ABC News, Washington. Back here at home, we have been waiting so very patiently for some fall weather. It finally arrived and it is just like, I just want to soak it all in. I know I spent all day outside before coming to work yeah. and it's it feels good to be back. I'm guessing the pumpkin patches <laughs> and the theme parks with all their Halloween yes. stuff were pretty popular places today. Oh, I'm sure they were. This is what we wait for. You know, September, when other parts of the country start to cool down a little bit more, we're still pretty hot. Uh, so this is what uh, we've been waiting for for a while, and tomorrow will be another beautiful day. By the way, Courtney, welcome back. Yeah, welcome back. <laughs> Load. Like she's been here forever. <laughs> You picked a great weekend to come back. I know, Ooh, I know. I'm very thrilled. <laughs> low temperatures today. 57 was our low in San Antonio, but we did have some upper 40s in the hill country. And these morning lows will be a few degrees lower tomorrow morning. So more of us will be in the mid to upper 40s early on Sunday. Mostly clear skies, light winds overnight. And that'll kind of be the difference from last night. Last night we still had a lingering breeze, some higher wind gusts. Tonight our winds will be light and that's going to allow temperatures to drop a few more degrees. So we are looking at a really cool start to the day tomorrow. Currently at the airport, low 60s. The great number here, I mean that's pretty good, but the good number is our dew point. It is uh, in the low 40s. So very comfortable out there and winds are out of the north just about five to 10 miles per hour. I did want to point out though that our sensor at the airport is reading mostly cloudy, but if you peeked outside at all today, you know, we had a lot of blue sky and some of those high, thin, wispy clouds moving in. And that's the type of cloud cover we have overhead. Our sensor there at the airport, it just sees that high thin cloud cover and thinks it's mostly cloudy. It has a hard time distinguishing behind, uh, between different types of clouds. So we just have some more of those thin clouds streaming in from the west, and we're going to pick up a bit more coverage of these clouds tomorrow. So here's a great KSAT Connect picture. These thin, wispy cirrus clouds, they're actually so high up that they're getting pushed around by the jet stream winds, and that's why they look kind of wispy and some of them are going in different directions because they are being steered uh, by the winds in the upper levels of the atmosphere. So we'll see more of these tomorrow, a slightly higher coverage, but still a really pleasant day on Sunday, starting off in the upper 40s in the morning, low to mid 70s in the afternoon, winds light north northeast 5 to 10 miles per hour and another day tomorrow uh, with some low humidity in place. Currently, we're in the low 60s at the airport. Some spots in the hill country already in the low 50s. It's 51 in Kerrville, 55 in Rock Springs. The air 
nice and dry. Our dew points are in the 30s and 40s, so it'll be a combination of the dry air and the lighter winds overnight that will help our lows to fall down into the upper 40s for a lot of us. Uh, dew points will be staying low for the next couple of days. Sunday into Monday, they'll still be in pleasant and dry territory, and again, that's just what makes it feel really crisp and fall like out there. As we get into Tuesday, dew point numbers will start to climb and then they'll stay pretty elevated through the back half of next week. But that higher humidity will come with another low end chance of rain. We don't have any big weather systems moving in over the next week or so. But as we get into Thursday, Friday, the start of next weekend, just a few little subtle pieces of rain making energy. These orange colors that you see here, uh, they will move on in. Pair that with some higher humidity and we'll reintroduce some low end rain chances beginning Thursday of next week, potentially continuing through the start of next weekend. We'll worry about that later. In the meantime, let's enjoy the next couple of days with low humidity and highs in the 70s, guys. We can, actually, we can actually call it fall, I think. Yeah. My goodness, I'm so happy about it. <laughs> Took forever, but hey, it's finally <laughs> it here. All right, Larry, the Roadrunners continue to run all over the competition this season, and today they did it for homecoming. Then they dominated Rice, outgaining them 403 yards, so 102. Total domination from UTSA's, they improved to 7-0, and, and like Gerber said, they did it for homecoming. Plus, in high school football, big game coverage, the Johnson Jaguars are still undefeated. They had a tough one today coming up. Red hot UTSA football played Rice at the Alamo Dome today for homecoming in front of a season high crowd 27,515. First quarter, first offensive series of the game. Frank Harris calls his own number, fakes the handoff, then runs into the end zone. Seven yards and the Roadrunners lead seven to nothing. Later in the first, 10 zip UTSA, ball on their six yard line. Handoff goes to Sincere McCormick. He runs through a huge hole, and 81 yards later, he's pushed out of bounds at the 13 yard line. Great hole by the O line. Two plays after that, BJ Daniels runs off guard, 11 yards, and UTSA is pulling away 17 to nothing, and they're not done. Ensuing possession for Rice, Al's quarterback Jake Constantine throws. Clarence Hicks bats the pass into the air right to Trevor Harmonson, who snags it and takes it back 40 yards for a pick six. It's 24-0 UTSA. They led 31 zip at halftime, and the Roadrunners win at 45-0, the largest margin of victory in Conference USA play in school history, improving to 7-0. We had to come out there at the Alamo Dome and play, play well at home, and I think we did that. So it was just a great, complete game for all of us, and uh, we're just blessed to, to be 7-0. It was a lot of fun. You know, we practiced hard all week, and for us to come out today and, and pitch a shutout, it... It means a lot to this defense. It means a lot to the staff. It means a lot to the city, too, probably. UTSA will hit the road to face Louisiana Tech next Saturday at 6 p.m. Head coach Eric Morris and the UIW Cardinals back at home looking for their fifth straight win and facing Nickel State. Second quarter, home team down 21 to 7. Quarterback Cameron Ward eludes the rush, cuts back against the grain, and finds Trevor Beggy over the middle. And he's got running room. Beggy with a huge 67 yard catch and run sets up first and goal at the 10 yard line. Very next play, check out the pump fake from Ward. He finds Taylor Grimes in the back of the end zone for a 10 yard touchdown. Grimes finishes with a school record four touchdowns, and the Cardinals come from behind it defeat Nichols 38-21. Texas State taking on Troy and Sutbelt conference play third quarter. Brady McBride finds Travis Graham in the end zone. Great throw, great catch for a 20-yard touchdown. Bobcats led 28-24, but the Trojans come back to win 31-28. Trinity has a chance to improve to 5-0 this afternoon, hosting Millsaps, and it doesn't take long for the home team to get on the board. Opening drive, second play from scrimmage. Winston Hutchinson bursts through the line and outraces the defense of the end zone for a 70-yard touchdown. Hutchison has two scores on the day and the Tigers are still undefeated 46 to nothing. Beautiful day at Comalander Stadium this afternoon. Number four, Johnson taking on Madison in District 28 6A. First quarter tied at seven. Jaguars on the move. Cruz Kerwin finds Eladio Gonzalez over the middle and the senior tight end rumbles all the way inside the five yard line to give Johnson first and goal. A few plays later, Ben McCreary breaks the plane for a one yard touchdown. 14 to seven Jaguars. Mavericks answer back. Miguel Becker finds a seam and races to the end zone for the 10 yard score to tie the game at 14. But Johnson 
wins a back and forth battle 42 35. Same stadium later in the evening Clark versus Roosevelt and the Rough Riders get on the board first in the first quarter. Brian Roeder finds Dylan Coleman in the flat and he runs right through a trio of defenders for a 10 yard score and a 7 nothing lead. But the Cougars respond after a Carson Rogers interception. Luke Childs hits Michael Vasquez in the back of the end zone. That 12 yard strike ties it up at 7 in the final from Comalander 30 to 27 Roosevelt. Earlier in the afternoon Jefferson taking on Sam Houston at Alamo Stadium District 27 5A. Mustangs down 8 to nothing in the first quarter. Steven Morales hits Roland Ramirez in stride 67 yard touchdown. They go for two and convert to tie the game at eight. But the Hurricanes respond. A few drives later direct snap to Donovan Bill. He fights over the goal line for a one yard score and Sam Houston wins at 48 to 17. And coming up later in sports mixed results for the Horns and Aggies on the gridiron today guys. Another great Saturday full of football action. Thank you Larry. I'd rather not talk about some of it. <laughs> we'll be right. We'll see them later. <laughs> Welcome back. Shoppers could face challenges finding everything on their holiday wish list this year. Yeah, backlogs at ports in Southern California and a shortage of truck drivers are among the many challenges retailers are facing as they look to stock their stores. Here's ABC's Phil Lipoff with the details. Consumers all across the country continue to face rising prices and empty shelves amid supply chain disruptions. About 40% of all U.S. imports come through Southern California's ports, but right now ships filled with cargo containers are sitting off the coast of Los Angeles and Long Beach. We're getting things from ships onto, onto full freight to half freight. Those transition points are where we are seeing gaps. The cost of shipping a container from China to the U.S. skyrocketing from roughly $1,300 to more than $16,000, and it's taking nearly twice as long. What once took 41 days to arrive, now taking 75 days. A shortage of truck drivers is also complicating supply issues. The trucking industry, uh, a lot of them have sought other opportunities uh, in other sectors. The American Trucking Association estimates prior to the pandemic, the industry was short 60,000 drivers. That number has only increased with retirements and not being able to train new drivers because trucking schools have closed. Some larger retailers are chartering their own ships now, but small businesses could be hit hard. But it's very strange for us not being able to call up and ask for something again in a couple of days. It's very frustrating and it's, it's out of the norm. Earlier this week, President Biden announcing steps to fix the backlog, including having ports work around the clock and urging companies to work together. FedEx and UPS both increasing their operations. Their commitment to go all in on 24-7 operations means that businesses of all sizes will get their goods on shelves faster and more reliably. Phil Lipoff, ABC News, New York. Washington, D.C., the Soul Box Project on the National Mall honors victims of gun violence. Take a look. More than 200,000 handmade origami boxes represent the victims. The Soul Boxes, which line the length of the mall, are meant to be a visually stunning call to action. The project began as the vision of artist Leslie Lee. Visitors to the National Mall this weekend will be able to view the individual memorials personalized with names, messages, and compelling artwork. Court filings show Kobe Bryant's widow, Vanessa Bryant, may be compelled to take part in a psychiatric exam as part of her lawsuit against L.A. County. She filed a civil lawsuit in September 2020, seeking undisclosed damages after photos of the helicopter crash that killed her husband and daughter were leaked. Her attorneys responded that an involuntary eight hour psychiatric examination is unreasonable and that it does not take an expert to understand her emotional distress. Kobe Bryant, his daughter and seven others were killed in a helicopter crash in Calabasas, California in January 2020. The volcano in La Palma, Spain continues to spew fiery rivers of lava in large quantities. A new mouth opened today around noon local time, but so far has emitted only ash and black smoke. Volcanologists are saying that the eruption is likely to be a mid to long term event for many months to come. The lava has fully or partially destroyed more than 1500 buildings, most of them homes and covered more than 1600 acres. The government says about 7000 people so far have been forced to evacuate since the eruption. Still ahead on the night beat, how a local organization is making sure kids and child protective services are not forgotten. And next, we're taking a closer look into the racial disparities in our criminal justice system, what the sentencing project is trying to accomplish by collecting the statistics. Stay with us. 
Black Americans are incarcerated nearly five times more than white Americans in state prisons. That is the headline coming out of a new report by the Sentencing Project. What's behind this alarming trend and what can be done about it? Chris Wynn takes a deeper dive. Across America, racial disparities in our criminal justice system are being brought to the forefront. This is a fear and a threat and for some a reality in our community. A new report authored by advocacy group The Sentencing Project shows that black Americans are incarcerated in state prisons at nearly five times the rate of white Americans. In fact, using data directly from some states, the U.S. Census Bureau and the U.S. Bureau of Justice Statistics, the report found that one in 85 black adults per 100,000 people in the U.S. is serving time in a state prison. It changes, um, you know, the way human beings interact when they leave. It changes their job opportunities, their education, their housing, their family relationships. They have a stigma. According to the report, Wisconsin leads the nation with the highest rate of imprisonment. One in every 36 black residents in the state is incarcerated, and they comprise 42 percent of Wisconsin's prison population. However, black people are just 6 percent of the state's resident count. In response, the Wisconsin Department of Corrections released a statement saying it has taken certain administrative steps towards lowering the population in its adult institutions, including changes to the community supervision policy and earned release program. But civil rights advocates say more work must be done. We have a disconnect between a system and institution that was supposed to be designed to keep us safe and protected, but because of the deep girded existence of uh, systemic and institutional racism um, and bias, um, that same institution is actually causing more harm and violence. To reduce the disparity, the project recommends decriminalizing low-level drug offenses and eliminating mandatory sentences for all crimes. They also recommend requiring racial impact statements to calculate the impact of proposed and existing crime legislation in different populations. Until we reckon, you know, with that of uh, reality that we have two different systems for whites and for blacks in this country. Um, you know, we're going to continue to see a criminal justice system that makes excuses for treating uh, African Americans differently. The perception of progress being challenged by actuality. In Washington, I'm Chris Wynn. All right, outside with a live cam, it feels great outside. So wonderful. Temperatures are falling into the 50s and many spots by early tomorrow morning will be in the 40s. So this time of year, if you want to head out to the pumpkin patch, you never know if you're going to need a sweater or if you're going to be sweating. See what I did? I didn't even plan that one. Uh, well, I can say with confidence tomorrow, maybe not a sweater in the afternoon, but it's going to be so comfortable. We'll see our afternoon highs back in the low to mid 70s. A few more clouds tomorrow, but another day of low humidity. So a great day to head out to some of our area pumpkin patches. We'll take another look at your full forecast coming up. We're catching up. It's been a while. It's been a while. I'm sorry. I had to be quiet for a second. We're just so happy. I'm so happy to be back. Nice to have the whole team back together. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I missed you guys. A hundred percent. We have. It was a busy week as far yes. as weather goes. Ups and ups and downs. Uh, we're you know we're rewarded with great weather this weekend, but of course we did have uh, some severe storms and unfortunately some deadly flooding Wednesday night into early on Thursday. Uh, that was, you know, terribly unfortunate, um, the, the deadly flooding, and it certainly was inconvenient for a period of time Wednesday night into Thursday, but we've managed to rack up some good rainfall this month so far. 5.6 inches of rain, that's at San Antonio International, and that puts us three and a half, a little bit more than three and a half inches above where we typically are uh, this point in the month. So we're doing really well for ourselves in terms of rainfall this month. Also on the year since January 1st, uh, about 31 and a half inches of rain and that spot on five inches above average for this point through the year. So looking good in terms of rainfall next several days will be rain free. It's not until about Thursday of next week that we start to reintroduce some low chances of rain. 
High temperatures today just absolutely beautiful. Our warmest spot, Catula, with a high of 81, but it was still very comfortable with lower humidity. High in New Braunfels, 76, and a high of just 70 up in uh, Texas wine country there in Fredericksburg. It was actually a very cool day across the majority of the country through the plains over toward the Rockies. High temperatures. 70 in Denver, 59 in Casper, and then toward the Great Lakes on the East Coast. A pretty cool day as well. The high in New York, 76, a high of 81 in D.C. The same front that came through here yesterday actually cleared the rest of the country today and it produced some rain and some storms along parts of the east coast um, and the mid-atlantic and there's even th some rain lingering up in uh, the northeast currently uh, but that front of course cleared our area really nicely last night and moving in behind it we've got in um, an area of surface high pressure um, high pressure at the surface essentially means rain free generally really sunny. We do have some high clouds that continue to stream in from the west. So with this surface low hanging with us tomorrow, things are going to stay really pleasant. We'll have the high clouds, but our winds will be light. Now as we get into Monday, especially by Tuesday, you'll notice that surface high pressure starts to move east and away from us. As that happens, our surface wind direction will actually change, and that is what is going to usher the humidity back in, but really not until Tuesday. So a northerly wind tomorrow will help to keep our air nice and dry. By Monday, dew point numbers will start to climb a bit. You really won't notice much change, but certainly by late Tuesday into Wednesday, a southerly wind will return and that'll bring our humidity back up. But we do have a couple more days where things will be really comfortable. Currently 56 in Hondo, 55 in Rock Springs and 64 in Catula. Our dew point numbers are low across the board, so we've got dry air in place and also pretty light winds, just about 5 to 10 miles per hour at most, but winds are calm in spots. The dry air, the light wind overnight will help our temperatures for a lot of us to fall into the 40s as we start the day tomorrow. So an early morning walk or jog is certainly going to be on the cool side. We'll warm back up nicely into the low to mid 70s tomorrow afternoon. Some additional high clouds, but still a very pleasant day and we'll keep the dry air around into Monday, feeling a bit more humid by the middle of next week, and then some low in rain chances return by Thursday. Guys, I'm loving it so much. I actually caught, I posted this, I actually caught a double rainbow a couple days ago. Oh, very nice. Very good luck. All right, plug your ears here, Courtney. <laughs> it's 11.06, and Texas is 0-2 against schools from Oklahoma. I'll tell you, you I You could certainly, have been nicer about the way you did that. I certainly wish I had better news for you today, Courtney, for your first day back. Uh, <laughs> Longhorns. Oklahoma State, UT just cannot protect a lead. Plus, the Aggies turn to ground and pound today, and they put up some big numbers coming up.